Welcome, everybody. This is this is my pleasure to uh, welcome you during uh, now, I think, the fourth meeting of Gender Wars East and South uh, Network. So let me just say that uh, this is uh, our network is uh, is a collaboration of the University of Oxford, Central European University, Federal University of Bahia, University of Amsterdam, University of Brasilia and the Un Un University of Warsaw and the artist Karol Radicheski. And we are interested in looking at um, conflicts around gender and sexuality, and and looking at uh, you know global backlash against gender and sexual rights. Uh, and uh, today, this is this is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Karol Radziszewski, who is a member of uh, our network, but he's also the major. Polish queer artist working with the archives and working with uh, this kind of materials that we as the historians and social scientists are also working with. And and Carol, uh, and we are really thrilled that Carol decided to join our network because he works on both uh, regions we are interested in, so, which is uh, which are. Um, Eastern Europe and Latin America. So, Carol, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, the floor is yours. And now I stop uh, sharing. <clears throat> okay, hello everyone. Thank you, Agnieszka, for introduction. Uh, I was thinking how and what to pre present you because there's a lot of issues, a lot of stuff. So, I just want to say briefly about the structure. I, I will present the PDF presentation and we focus on a bit introduce how I work, what I do and talk a bit about my archival practice. And then I think it would be around 25 minutes for one half, uh, half an hour. And then I want to show two fragments of the videos that I will share through the screen. And then I will be happy to talk. But if something is not clear or you don't not sure, please also interrupt me during the presentation because um, Sometimes I'm getting obsessed with the topic and going too fast. Then <laughs> uh, also it's a lot of context and informations and um, and sorry also for pronunciation of some names in Portuguese. So I will share the screen and uh, start immediately with the presentation. Is it the full screen? Yes. Okay. So as I said, I will start a bit with introducing myself. So I'm a visual artist. I was graduated from the Painting Institute in the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. But from the very beginning, I was interested in something that is beyond the, let's say, art bubble, how to communicate pe with people, how to share uh, the information, knowledge, and so on. So in 2005, I started this magazine called Dick Fagazine which the idea was to focus on homosexuality and masculinity in Central and Eastern Europe and how it's, um, but at the beginning it was more about Poland, then I started to travel more. But also wanted to mention that uh, in 2005, I made the exhibition called Fagots and it's uh, it was later announced the first openly gay exhibition in the history of Poland. So although we have some traces in the history, especially now, we are introducing some artists that we can say that they were queer, but they were never openly presenting this work in the terms of the sexuality. So I'm saying that to show you how this history is quite short and also that it uh, was kind of turning point for, for also for me. And I'm usually when I'm talking about it, I'm saying that it's all my archival research started from the very private. Uh, and I, I'm saying also this because it's more general thought. It started from the very private, uh, let's say, cause that when I come out, when I was 20 something to my parents, to my mom, they couldn't refer to anything. For them, it was just something from the West, like they didn't even know Andy Warhol. So I would say, they could say something about Freddie Mercury or George Michael, and that's it. So there was no any understanding how uh, this uh, identity could be referred to local context. And with the magazine, at the beginning, I was trying to focus on what is happening in Poland, cover the current situation. But in 2009, I started to work on the special issue that 
in 2011 was ready and published on the title before 89. And the idea was to collect the materials from all the neighbor countries about the queer life in the, mostly in the communist times. So cruising spots, some uh, information about the people, mostly homosexual men from that period and, and so on. Um, I mean, it's a lot of material, so I'm just briefly showing you so you could get the idea how I work and how I started. The, the magazine is based on uh, interviews, oral history. I usually, I'm not hardly editing, I'm putting a lot of uh, almost like a transcript of the discussions or talks, then some archival photographs and materials are coming. And this main tool, this magazine is very irregularly published, but it's the thing that I'm doing since the beginning until now. Now I'm working on a very new issue that will come out in April. It will be about the, quite obviously about Ukraine and the queer history of Ukraine. I collaborate with Ukrainian artists, but uh, every, every time the issue is, uh, like, I mean, sometimes it's monographic issue dedicated to some countries, sometimes it's more mixed. Um, but this is just the intro and uh, it will be, I will be kind of referring to that, but just wanted to show you. What I wanted to tell, it's a um, story of Richard Kishel, but to tell that I have to start with hyacinth operation or hyacinth action, as we call it. It's an um, action that, happen that happened in Poland from 85, 87. It started November 15. And um, it was, it's, it's a kind of a crucial moment because we can consider it as a Polish Stonewall, although it was completely different uh, dynamic. I mean, that to, to, to be more precise, the action started and it was for two days and nights in November 85, then it repeated in 86 and it repeated 87. So it was not all the time, it was just some events. And basically the idea of the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, inter, internal affair, um, internal affair, I'm not sure the phrase, but it's, yeah. Uh, had the idea to make the list of all homosexuals living in Poland basically to pro they were saying that they want to protect them from the criminal cases and because of the HIV and AIDS just started but the main goal was to as we learn later to uh, to threat them but also to blackmail them and later use to work to force them to work with the secret service police so it was very oppressive action and the dynamic was that they were calling people at home or the places they were been, they've been working, like schools or some offices, and ask them to come to the police station. Uh, partly they based on the data that they already have, like uh, for example, in Szczecin, one of the cities in Poland, in the North Poland, this is what the best documented because it's also important that this action happened in a different cities on a different scale, but it was very dependent on the local police station. So it was very different for the, each city. And uh, just counting on what we found in Szczecin, we could say that it was 11,000 or something like that, so-called pink files collected throughout this action. And um, it was terrifying and it was really something for the very, very first time, the, the community, I, I think we can say only about men, so it's like a gay community or homosexual community because they were not using the gay word at that time yet. Uh, the, found themselves together in a way or re seen as a kind of a community because of that action. And uh, there's not much documentation. This is what you see. It was just covered in one of the police newspapers and re kind of reacting, reenacting this photograph. So there is not really like a documentation. But basic, but, but it, it's an action that has the still impact and it's not super well researched because the files are very spread out. And also there was no any um, reaction from the community. I mean, there was no riots or fights with the police. That's also different from Stonewall, definitely. And I will get back to you uh, to that later because it's a very also specific uh, dynamic of all that. Maybe I have to also mention here that Poland was one of the first countries in the world to decriminalize the homosexual acts between uh, the, the act, sexual acts between men in 1936 uh, no uh, sorry 1932 and they were never introduced again also during the communist time they were not introduced in Poland which was very different from all the other 
countries of the region. So when I research in, um, I don't know, Belarus, Ukraine, Romania, it's a different situation because every document, every material photo letter, it's a proof of crime. In Poland, it was different which is also interesting discussion how this police violence it's and the beginning of the movement have the different dynamic but i will also get back to that when i'll be talking about brazil uh richard kishel the activist the guy who is, was working the whole life in the printing house based in gdansk harbor northeast part of uh, no uh uh, north part of Poland, sorry. Uh, he was also interrogated during this action. He's one of the witnesses, but he was also one of the few who said like, oh, so if police make the coming out for me, I don't have to be afraid of anything and I can do whatever I want. So the same time when the action started, that's why just this turning point, he started to do the magazine or rather zine called Philo. Here you can see some mock-ups. Uh, they were making as a bigger collages and then distributed as Xerox. Uh, usually they were saying that it's less than 100 copies, so it was not going through the censorship. But it was quite widely distributed, especially later. People were Xeroxing, sending to each other. So it was become for the whole country kind of the zine that was circulating. It most The, the main focus was to prevent HIV and AIDS. But it was also a bit of information from different uh, countries, what is happening in TV, if anything related to LGBT community was mentioned, and so on and so on. Uh, Gdańsk, it's a uh, harbor, so it was also interesting that the gay sailors were involved in the network. They were bringing some magazines from other countries by on the ships. It was a very open city, and that was the access to some uh, other materials. Here you can see the editorial team. They hold the philo logo, and they, but there are also some images from the parties when they were they were not drag queens, they were not uh, transgender, but they were rather a bunch of gays playing with costume, with the gender, with the makeup, and Richard Kisha was leading uh, figure, and he was really enjoying to do that. He also creates something really amazing. This is like a really treasure because he was working in a printing house. He created. Uh, I don't know, like three or almost 400 empty pages book that he called Polish Gay Guide on the European Socialist Countries. And in a very conceptual way, he put the names of the countries and cities, not only capitals that he want to visit. And he was like Prague, for example, and he was doing small notes when he was traveling on a train to these countries and then putting in this one copy of the book all the information about saunas, cruising spots, time of the meetings, everything that you could find about the uh, gay lifestyle at that time, in the, mostly in the 80s. And he was coming, uh, traveling all Central Eastern Europe, a lot of to, to Prague, to Budapest, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, and so on was also doing a small uh, uh, photographs documenting the places from the outside, which is also a very interesting case for the um, uh, historians because uh, people who are from particular countries, like from, for example, from, from Czech, uh, from Prague, they have images from the inside of these places, but not from the outside. So being this gay tourist with the special eye and the camera, it's also something very interesting and very um, interesting document. If you would be interested in any of those, I would be happy to send you more details, images and stuff. I'm just trying to go briefly through the whole uh, material because it's so much that I want you to see how, how it's organized. So Richard Kisha was also a photo amateur, mostly photographing his boyfriend, Valdek. Valdek was a um, regular worker working on a construction site and he was very well built. Uh, perfect body so he was a main model for Richard Kishel when he was developing the photographs in the darkroom but once this action happened this hyacinth action and Richard decided to do whatever he wants he decided to with the bunch of his friends in house of one of them created the photo shootings only one of them have kind of art education in high school the rest were just people who are not really into art but they have a positive um, slides, films, and the camera, and they made a series of photographs in the form of the slides that were presented somehow like a frame after frame. They didn't have a, a film camera, so they were doing photographs as a kind of substitute for the um, films. 
with the intention that with the music they will be presented in the private parties, a bit like Nan Gold, the early slideshows. And although they have the say, gay sailor friends, they were not that much informed what was happening um, in other countries. So for example, this picture reminds a lot about the Rocky, uh, uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show, but they said they didn't know about it at that time. So they were rather playing with the costumes, the things that they could found, very punk kind of uh, makeup. And it is very interesting for me because after that glass creep, I'm calling this queer before gay, like really this moment when they are not, the homosexuality is not criminalized. They don't fight for the gay rights. They just express themselves bef before the communists will fall down, before the mm, transition will start and transformation of the uh, society and country and so on. And not any Polish artists were working in this field with this kind of images at that time. So it's also very interesting that they were amateurs, they were never considered artists and not any art historian or academic reached that archive. They were always under the bed of this guy until I started to do the, some research just for my magazine, just to know my, I was 20 something and I just wanted to learn something for myself. So it was also very interesting for me that this kind of archive and how you could find them. And it's really like, we could say almost like a gender performance into the camera when Richard Kisha is dressing up, undressing and so on. It's a lot of a lot of issues also related to AIDS and HIV, visual expression that not any Polish artists were dealing with at that time, only in the 90s and mostly straight artists. So this is very, very unique. I made the whole film about it. It's half an hour, it's accessible online, but I'll also send you the links later. We're not gonna <laughs> watch now the half an hour film, but it's also, it's called Kishelan, because for me, it's important to say that from this oppression of Hayasan action, Kishelan, partic this particular guy created the whole world around him and create kind of community with the magazine, with the visuals and so on, but also the network that started to really work against the system. And also it was a kind of underground and alternative even to the opposition, because this is what I would be also trying to talk today, that it's very interesting for me when we think about Eastern, Eastern Europe and communist times and how the whole opposition was, I would not say right wing, but fighting with the communists and with the leftists in a way whatever it sounds I'm not going with the details now I know it's not precise but it's it, and it's kind of opposite in Brazil how uh, how those things were similar and different this is something that is very interesting for me we can get to that uh, later when we will be talking because I know I'm just mentioning this quite briefly but um yeah and uh uh, through all this research and materials, not only from Richard Kishel, although his archive become kind of a uh, main um, source for my uh, work, I decided to create in 2015 something that I call Queer Archives Institute. And also I'm saying, when I'm showing this, usually I'm saying like, oh, I, I, I didn't know how to call it. I thought it would be like a Polish Institute or Polish archives and Central Eastern European. And, and then I thought if it would be North America, it would be just global. So I decided to make Queer Archives Institute for the whole world, but focus only on Central Eastern Europe and uh, some other countries that other people call periphery, periphery countries. And it happened that I was invited to do residence in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, in Video Brazil. So the first, first ever launching of the project and the exhibition was uh, in Video Brazil, so in Sao Paulo, in Brazil in 2016. The exhibition was called Queer Archives Institute. And it was already the beginning of something that I uh, develop constantly now, which means I create the kind of a para institution as an artist that function not like a gay and lesbian museum, but rather institute that it's very performative. Every time the exhibition lecture performance is occupying some other institution, I'm just putting this huge logo. So playing with this idea of the institution and how we build this notion. Usually I'm presenting, I'm recording oral history from local representatives of um, queer community, but also you, I'm using archival materials from the, like from here, from Videotech of Video Brazil. And then the crucial point, there are these tables. The tables, uh, or rather vitrines, that uh, 
all the objects that are there uh, with the full description, but the idea, my idea as an artist is to really juxtapose them, like really see them visually, how they work together. So here you can see the huge table, half of this table are the first pages of, I think almost every queer magazine that show up in Brazil since the sixties, every first page of the first issue. And the other half of the, table it's um selection of the covers of the first issues and zines from the zines and magazines from central eastern europe and for me it's this weird queer geography and chronology because by judging who when the not judging but like by, by seeing in which year which country published the magazine and what kind of content was there you can really see the evolution or the uh dynamic if there were special events like hyacinth action this police repression or if it was more like in the case of brazil uh the first magazines in the 60s were run by the um, transgender or or cross dressers it's hard to say now from a current perspective but it was community-based small zines just to enjoy themselves i will get back to that uh, so I just posed the materials and it was quite refreshing for me, although it could look a bit like a mess because of this context of, and countries, but it's giving a different perspective on how you, we could um, see them. So here are the magazines, covers of the records, press clips, and so on. Mm, here it's uh, also the tables at the beginning I was showing a bit like a analog keyword so for example non-heteronormative women and then it's mixed the lesbian clubs from Prague the how lesbians were covering the pop pop, uh, pop uh, culture in Brazil and Lampiao the magazine that I will just briefly describe uh, in the next slides also uh, the issue of not only gender, but also the black community and how in queer community, black community was or not, or was not represented was something that I could add in Brazil, why in Poland and Central Eastern Europe is almost not exist this topic and also for different reasons. And uh, Osnop, the magazine that I mentioned, it, I was really lucky when I was in Brazil because uh, Maybe this also needs explanation. So I was invited to do the three months residency to make a new film. But instead of that, I will get obsessed with doing this archival research with zines. And I was also lucky that uh, many people somehow started to help me. And I found amazing stuff just by accident somehow. Also, when I reached Brazil, there was a constant discussion about global south and global north and i asked in poland is south or north and uh, because i always heard that we are just this global east and then uh, half of people were say yeah you are european union you are rich so you're obviously global north but then people said no because you are post-colonial so, so post-soviet country so you are a global south and that was very refreshing and reframing also for my division from very childhood that I heard like east and west east and west and we are want to be like a west but we are in the east so it was kind of re reshaping and I think it's also interesting for our project in general to think about this um, frames so Osnob the magazine that uh, popped up in the Rio de Janeiro in the 60s I have hundreds or thousands of slides this was used in a very specific technique uh, with the alcohol that it's disappearing with the light and so on so that's why this purple color violet color it's amazing zine uh, based on the photographs and advertisements from the fashion female or beauty magazines They're made by the cross dressers community some of them have wives kids but they are getting together and they will have the competition the most beautiful one of the year the most beautiful one one of the month and so on there was like a whole expression with the costume stories and and so on I don't have time to talk with details I'm showing just two slides but just to give you a glimpse what I was working on then the magazine that I wanted to talk about and that I found uh, I, I was also become a friend with the one of the founders Lampiao de Squina uh, that was started in 1978. It was between Rio and Sao Paulo, but it was distributed in the whole country. And it was just uh, in the moment when the Brazil was a bit more open with the dictatorship, but still under depression. 
uh, I'm not specialist, so I'm not go also with the details to <laughs> not I'm not an expert, but just uh, this magazine was very special also because it was covering a lot of issues, not just the male homosexuality, but also transgender, um, feminism, lesbianism, also the black communities and. It was amazing newspaper, really well done as an editorial work also. There is a whole film about it, documentary come out some years ago. But um, this magazine, it's uh, also covering the, a lot of this discussions about gender and since the end of the 70s. So it's also interesting how it's evolving with the discourse and how it was much more advanced in that sense than anything that I found in Central Eastern Europe at that time. This is general rem uh, remark that the issues related to gender and between gender and so on are much more represented uh, in Latin America than Central Eastern Europe, that's for sure. Also, the, mega the, the newspaper was covering a lot of debates and protests, and it was like a serious um, press. Also, the repression and uh, the... I don't have all these images here because it's like also again hundreds but uh, and also I don't speak Portuguese so I just present you what I know from also working with people when I was in Sao Paulo but this repression was documented and then I interviewed Jean Sylvie Trevisan and he is still alive he's a uh, almost 80 now he's a filmmaker journalist writer uh, he wrote this book uh, Perverts in Paradise that was translated into English and uh, after I finish this presentation, I would like to show you uh, 10 minutes from the interview I did with him, because I think it will be really interesting a uh, few issues that he's mentioning. Then I also interview Laerche, the most, one of the most famous people, artists in Brazil, working from the early years, 70s, with the comic stripes, like for, for the main newspaper, uh, first with the more connected with opposition, later more mainstream one, friends with the politicians that were important into the turning from dictatorship. But, uh, and then she introduced herself as a cross-dresser and later um, as a transgender. And um, when I interviewing her, it was also interesting that uh, we don't have time to show everything. So I will not show this interview, but I can send you the link. It's a long interview, but it was very interesting for me that she was also what was different from what the, I was interviewing in Poland, the transgender people, that she's mentioning the issue of class and how privileged she is. And also from that perspective, how she is treated or how she trying to help to the transgender community in Brazil. It's a lot of issues and also issue of being safe and being more risks and uh, exposed to the risk are in that uh, definitely. Mm. And then I just briefly wanted to show you a bit how I work with Cuyacaf Institute. Those are the photos uh, from Colombia, from Bogota. I never been there, but my friend uh, who is there, he said like, why not to do Cuyacaf Institute show there? Because the, usually the problem is with all the countries that I'm traveling to, I'm saying like, I'm just, you know, I'm just there two weeks, one month. It's not enough to do the research. I don't also want to colonize like this Polish guy coming and doing the research for you and presenting. But then people are also, especially in Latin America, like Colombia and Brazil were telling me, you know, it's so, it's, it's, it's so European, this obsession with history and archives that actually nobody cares and nobody's doing there, these things, because we have much more urgent issues, like really our rights are in danger. So there is no time for, you know, going with the archival materials and so on. Now it's a bit changing and I see, and I know the project also from Brazil that are focusing on the archives and collecting, but it was also kind of a moment for me that I said, okay, I could help with my tools, my methodology, how to do it. And the funny thing is that in many of these countries, my queer friends saying, you know, we have, archives but all the people are fighting with each other the small groups that are fighting each other and they can't get to the one point that they could do one show but I'm always but they present me as a foreigner journalist because I have the magazine and then everybody wants to talk with me this foreigner journalist is coming and kind of everybody wants to give the interview show what they have so so my friend in Bogota said that it will be a good 
moment to kind of do this kind of show because you will be kind of connecting people so we have the show here you can see a bit of performance that was uh, inside the exhibition but there was all the mixture of the materials from Central Eastern Europe and from uh, Colombia. You have, for example, wallpaper in the background based on my work and the Richard Kishi collages from the 80s from Poland and the HIV and AIDS uh, dedicated posters on it from Colombia. The same with the, the magazines and books. And again, there was no real connection in the past, but suddenly by juxtaposing these materials, there was a lot of new interesting issues and questions popping up. Just uh, more images from this show. Then my major tool, it's uh, oral history. So I started with Dick Fagazine as a magazine with interviews, but later I was really interested in filming people, the document the community. So here is Susanna Tratnik from Ljubljana, Slovenia, talking about the early lesbian pro uh, magazines and zines like Lesbo, Revolver, Lesbo Zine, Vix, and so on. Here is just a glimpse of the shows that I organize in the form of the Kuyakov Institute installations. So. You don't have to remember the cities, places, and the days. Just want to show you how I work, like I juxtapose the material and how it's part of the exhibitions. Although it's important also that I'm using my paintings and the queer portrait as a part of the narration and also as a tool to introduce the stories that I learned from the research into something very visual, sometimes very simple, very figurative paintings, but the power of the figurative painting, I realized it's really important when we talk about the exhibitions, distribution, reproduction, how it could function on the social media, through the posters and so on, how people are, especially in the countries that it's not, those stories are hided, like in Poland, like those images could circulate and giving uh, courage for the people who could really literally use them. So here you can see, on the right side, there is the small painting portrait of Lesia Ukrainka, big national Ukrainian hero that was lesbian. But on the right side, this bigger uh, image, it's Solidarity, the logo probably you recognize. And the, per the person portrayed on that painting, it's uh, Eva Houshko. She was the leading, leading figure of the opposition in the communist time, uh, part of the Solidarity movement, really she was in jail she was really fight she's a hardcore fighter that also she had this pseudonym that is on the painting called harda which is like a tough and i will show you a few minutes from from long from five hours interview that i did with her at the very end uh, when we switch from the presentation I, I will show you but just so you know that i'm talking about her but this is really like a crucial case study for me. So she was involved in solidarity movement, fighting with communists, with the leftists. She was, she's very religious. She's also part of this change that uh, make everything different in Poland after 1989. And also in 2000, in 2000, she made the, one of the first in Poland full transition at once, uh, uh, as an operation um, uh, and come out as a transgender person. So from that moment, be, being a big hero and even invited to be one of the vice minister in one of the governments uh, of the new democratic uh, elected uh, Polish um, government, she refused because she knew that she's transgender. She was preparing herself to transition. And then she slowly started to be erased from the history, from the books, from the records, from the meetings with her friends from old times. It's a, one of the most clear example how the only being transgender, only dealing with sexuality, identity, and this politics, she's erased from the more general Polish history and how this is act is continue and how it's evolved from 70s, 80s. She's also telling me in the interview when the solidarity movement was formed, how she was insisting, trying to, a bit like Agnieszka was saying, how to fight with other people to get bored them for hours to force them to introduce through the introduction to the new constitution, the fragment about the freedom for everyone, also for sexual minorities, gender uh, and so on. And uh, so she's a really fighter and it's a really very interesting case. Uh, this is the painting, a huge one that I paint. 
uh, basically, I refer to the style of the 80s and I reverse Lech Wałęsa, the most famous male figure from that poster, into her to make like a, something that you could reproduce and visually think how it works differently if Eva is on the poster instead of Wałęsa or just as equal as he. And this is what I do as a visual artist, how I use the strategies of the visual images and how they could uh, kind of uh, tell the history in a different way. This is uh, just a uh, frame from the interview that I would did with her and that I will present uh, soon. And at the very end of the presentation, just want to show you another painting. It's portrayed uh, the tension of Margot. Two years ago, it was a big, the, Margot was a, she is non-binary activist who was, uh, she destroyed the, homo, the, the, the track with the homophobic slogans and she was detained and the whole bunch of people, queer community, DJs, artists were trying to protect her. The police were super violent, probably one of the most violent actions in the whole European Union of the police against the LGBT community in the recent years. And um, so this, painting was made just two weeks after she was detained because I also thought there is a lot of press clips, uh, photographs and so on. But again, through this medium of painting, a bit playing with Guernica and Picasso style, how you could uh, immortalize these events that has happened just now. So here you can see the car that she's inside, the police and also on the top, the guy. Most of those people on this painting, you can know by names, but I just wanted to more uh, express as a more general image of the police violence. And again, these events were called the uh, Polish Stonewall. So the second after Hyacinth action. A lot of topics I know, a lot of information. We can discuss this later. Just wanted to briefly show you this. Now I will stop sharing and I will just share uh, with film. Um, just a second. Uh, yeah, so I would just, now I would just show 10 minutes from the film of uh, interview with Jean-Sylvie Trevisan. This is his book, uh, Pervertido Saparatiso, something like that, but it was called, uh, translated as a perverts in paradise and published in London. It's basically the, from the colonial times until the eighties when it was published, the history of the, so for all of you, I think it's really worth it to read it. Definitely. Now it's a new version. He just, I think two years ago, he published very extended version. But uh, now to the technical thing, I will share the screen. I hope I'll find the video. I will share the video. I will make it look uh, the whole screen. Just a second. Okay. Yeah, it's working. It's working, okay. I see the full screen. Great. And now I want to just show you, it will be like a 10 minutes around 10 minutes, but I think there are a few issues are really addressed here that could be interesting for all of us. So, and Joel. They, 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 uh, in, we were interrogated and uh, then um, it went on, we didn't stop. And I guess one, one year later, uh, the uh, justice decided we were not guilty. Uh, uh, for the 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 um, crime we were accused of, uh, which was immorality um, uh, and, and against the um, uh, social good 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 social customs, and then and so we had other trouble like. Uh, um, uh, some uh, places where they they sell the. Uh, the, the newspapers uh, got uh, uh, leaflets from the right-wing people uh, with the uh, menacing to um, um, blow the place if they uh, didn't stop buying these newspapers. And Lampion was among the, in the list of these newspapers, usually leftist newspapers, you know? Um, so the, the 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 people who sold uh, and, and newspapers they were very scared. They the, the menace was to blow uh, the 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 kiosks with bomb with bombs, you know. And so uh, the the owners of the kiosks and 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 
sellers of the newspapers were, it was just for scaring them. Like uh, other uh, newspapers, uh, leftist newspapers or socialist or so-called socialist newspapers, but they were all very small and uh, they had lots of trouble to uh, to sell and, and things. It was not very easy. And lots of them, in the case of the leftist ones, they were all the time censored. All the time, they have to send the uh, the uh, articles uh, before to Brasilia to the censorship there. That was not the case for us because it was it was so uh, strange and funny in some ways. When I was interrogated in the police, they started asking me, "When were you in Cuba?" And I said, "Me, never." I don't know what you were talking about. And then one person to, uh, uh, told the, 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 the other, the sheriff or, or, or so, uh, that was the wrong inter interrogatory. <laughs> they, were, they didn't even know. And when I went back there again yeah, for having the real interrogatory, the, uh, the, the man asked me, what can I uh ask and what can i call you in, in which way can i call you and i say well you can call me viado and he was very scared you can call me fag and then he was very scared because they didn't know what to do you were with uh, um, a very well uh, dressed and everything with a, a lawyer uh, from the uh, the um, journalist um uh, syndicate uh, like in Poland, solidarity union, union, and the journalists' union. Oh, and then the, and he, he didn't know what to ask us uh, about. That's that's it. Probably there were there 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 were some uh, effects also interrogating us that's that's the reason because they were uh, uh, finding all these very strange what what um, it was very new in, in brazil uh, being persecuted for being gay we don't have this kind of uh, um, um, problem in our laws we never did you read my book and uh, our uh, civil code and um, uh, the um, police code, they uh, were very liberal because they were inspired in the French Revolution. There was no law in Brazil except in the military penal code. They had the, the special mention to not being gay in the uh, army. You know? And but in in the penal code and civil code in Brazil, we never had this this kind of expression, homosexual um, uh, lifestyle or something like this. In in spite of this, we had lots of trouble historically. Um, it was not a paradise. Never. Uh, the problem uh, was that. We were starting everything in Brazil in terms of uh, uh, gay rights. And uh, of course, the gay community, if you can say uh, we had a you know, gay community, we had uh, lots of gay people, uh, um, 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 almost invisible in some way. And uh, uh, as it was common in, in all over the, the, the world at that time, except probably a little bit in the States, but uh, they didn't have idea of gay rights. So we started talking about this and talking about gay consciousness, about these rights and how it was like to be gay and uh, to have and to practice and to fight for gay rights. And that was the reason we were so different from the gay lifestyle in some way. And in other ways, 
we were very close because uh, since the beginning, we decided having, for instance, the language of the ghetto. So we started using, you didn't understand this because of course you don't know Portuguese, but we use it all the time, the language of the ghetto in, in, in the, the newspaper. And uh, also we, um, we uh, the, were defending the, the um, um, uh, transvestites. We in Brazil had always lots of transgender people, uh, drag queens, especially in prostitution and in the streets. I remember when I came back from the, the my exile, uh, self-exile, I saw the streets crowded with transgender people. They were the first one fighting. And Lampion defended their rights, which were our rights. Yeah, they were... Uh, 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 seen as gay people too. And in some uh, moments, uh, the, the trouble with the police was so heavy that we um, uh, fought uh, very uh, uh, hard in order to defend these people. They were all the time being sent to the prison, all the time uh, being beaten by the police and uh, and they, 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 they were just the most fragile part of the gay community. And they were totally um, without uh, uh, defense. And they were, uh, they, 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 they didn't have families. Their families just uh, threw them away. That was the general uh, uh, story uh, about uh, transgender people. You know? And then we uh, had what I think was really new at that time, a consciousness about new kinds of fights because the left wing in Brazil at that time, uh, like, uh, like in all Latin America, Latin America, which I knew in Mexico and Argentina and Uruguay, for instance, in my travels, they were very, um, um, focused in 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 uh, um, um, proletariat and um, um, a kind of fight, a very Marxist way of looking to uh, fights in society, and we didn't fit the new fights, the new rights like feminists, like. Uh, an anti-racial uh, fight like uh, uh, ambientalism and, and gay rights. We had terrible fights with these people. And uh, Lampion all the time were, was uh, um, showing and, 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 and um, focusing in, in these fights too. So we were, we received uh, bullets from both sides, uh, the left and 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 the right, you know, and um, uh, so in 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 the uh, uh, group of Lampion, we tried for the group, we tried to attract uh, people from the um, uh, anti-racist uh, movement and feminists. I I I myself I wrote some articles with feminists, and we were all the time using uh, feminism in, in our approach to the gay rights. The, in the same way they did in the States. In the States, I guess, the gay movement uh, had lots of debts uh, to the feminist movement because uh, the concepts, for instance, uh, many concepts, the gay movement movement got came from the, the the feminist movement, yeah, sexism, macho men, and uh, well, many of them. Okay, and now I will show you uh, one more.
Is it visible? Yep. Okay. It will be just a few fragments of uh, maybe this I should mention, like uh, I will just show you a few fragments with an uh, interview with Eva Houshko and she's focusing on being in jail and she's describing how it was. Although we have to remember that she was in jail because of the being involved in opposition, not being transgender, obviously, but it's somehow giving the sense of this being in a repression, being a hero and then rejected by the contemporary so Polish society as a, somebody could not fit to this history. Um, Ja sobie rano po, tym, po tej wiadomości, jak wróciłam w nocy, o dziewiątej rano zaczyna siatka puka i, i mówi, czy, czy wie, wiem, co się dzieje. Dosłownie rano, czy o ósmej rano, to ty my. Sąsiadka z kpn zresztą, w tym samym domu. Konfederacja Polski nie podaje, jedyna partia, to są policyjne jeszcze powstała. Pragnęli wszystko, że rozbili pałani tego, co się dało rozbić, potem wiesz, porzucali porządeczkę. Ja mówię, słuchaj, no to ja szykuję się i idę. Zdziwiona, że mnie nie aresztowali. Pocowałam dziecko. No i też mam na wróciłam. Jak lat później to pewno. To było 15 grudzień. Kilka osób porozumiewało się, pozdrowili mnie, że ja żyję, ale nagle pojawiły się, wiem, policja, milicja pojawiła się szybko przez, uciekłam poprzez podwórkę i uciekłam, tego to było w poniedziałek rano, to było 14 uciekłam. Wiedziałam, że polują. No i 15 roku spotkałam się z dziewczyną, to na 16 grudnia, że przyszły, powiedziała jak, jakie miejsce, zbieramy się, ona ma lokum, robimy zebranie. 16 rozpocząłem konspirację. I zrobiliśmy pierwsze zebranie. Powiedziałam, że to jest tam wojenny, trzeba budować struktury, trzeba budować to dzień. Tak się zaczynało, nie odgórnie, tylko poszczególni ludzie zaczynali w ten sposób, a ja miałam Mir, że jak powiem, że był na członkiem zarządu nie aresztowany. Ukrywający w nie wyraszkowany. I, I mogłam to budować. Oczywiście była wówczas za to oficjalnie kara śmierci. Spotkaliśmy się pod ziemią, w jego mieszkaniu. Jurek mnie zobaczył, mówi, o, jaka fajnie jesteś. Kiedy czasem szczelimy. Jurek był normalny. Here I wanted to tell you because this is very interesting for me that she's describing one of the most prominent priests at that time who was supporting opposition and it's really interesting when we think, think about the frame of the history Polish history how she was involved and kind of friend not not kind she was a friend of him and when he was um Killed. She was carrying the whole funeral and so on. She was reading figure. And it's interesting when you think about Brazil, Poland, this uh, left and right wing and dictatorship, how we could see this unobvious connections and support. So I just decided to show you this part to, to point out this. But I know it's it's a bigger story. And then I will just show you a, a little fragment, like two minutes of how she's describing being in jail. I will skip the part that she's describing when she's just the first interrogation, because it's also interesting that they are taking out her uh, cross, like every, all the religious symbols to make, to provoke, provoke her because she's really believer fighting with this communism. It's this also, this opposition is interesting. And just one fragment from another investigation, uh, uh, interrogation. And then... Mam taką osobę, która przeprosiła i dla mnie nie ma już sprawy. Zbierczę. Odpakuję się, znaczy koc, zaszczytni na park. Na parterze dostaliśmy cele z wybitymi oknami, już jest sygnał. No, trzy miesiące to się dało. To jest wszystko wyczarne, naprawdę, minus 19 
Powiem kto to jest zwierzę, jak spór do wszystkiego. Porównanie człowieka ze sporem jest dobre. Wszystko w tym. A najgorsze na tym parterze były okres, kiedy wykonywane operacje. Za chwilę pani, pani dostanie jeszcze lat, bo to pani zobaczy, co jest na koniec. Wydaje pani, o tym mawiam z lesem. I do pani. Bo za tą stół. Zbierałem się z dwiema powietrzanką i tam przemowa mnie klawiszu. Zbierałem się drzwi, on widział, że to mu ma kamerę. Nagle widzę jego rękę. Dziękuję. Albo on dostali koniec komuny, koniec komuny, ludzie, koniec komuny, koniec komuny. Naprawdę jedno z najwyższych oznaczeń to nie dał tam w No i te ostatnie osoby robiliśmy się cisza. Wracam do tego dzisiejsza spokój. Napisałem wiersz o tym. Mam pewien się jedność na to, że ta, czy ja wiem, czy ta zapadnia nie jest pode mną, a jest w służbie, której ja już nie mają, to akurat obiadek z klasą. To jest takie, że człowiek ma wyginąć to są To jest straszna to, to. Okay, thank you. And uh, I will just add um, that Eva, she's trying to get back to politics. She's my, from my hometown, she's very close to me, but she was also attacked many times recently because of the homophobia, transphobia by the nationalists. It's discontinued. So I wanted to show you a bit of the history. As I said, she was not in prison because of her gender or anything or, or sexuality, but um, being that kind of hero who survived being now attacked many times because of the official homophobia and transphobia in Polish government and how it works with the current context. It's really something that's showing me that this history is really still present and this violence is an oppression. It's very up to date, unfortunately. So thank you for now for the presentation films and I will be very happy to talk with you. I'm open for the questions and maybe the thoughts you have related to materials. I know it was a lot and different topics, but as I said, I just wanted to just show a bit the research. Thank you so much, Carol. That was fascinating. And I think that before we open up for everybody, I know that Flavia uh, has to leave and uh, in 15 minutes, but she really wanted to, you know, start the discussion. So should I, do you want to, you know, start Flavia? Okay, Agnieszka, thank you so much. Carol, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really fascinating. I, I enjoyed it so much and it made me think about so many things. And that, so I will uh, try to be quick, but um, you made me think about some of the perspectives we have uh, to discuss these different trajectories of uh, queer activism in Brazil and uh, Eastern Europe or Poland specifically, and also how feminism also, that's what I know better, like feminist movements also have these trajectories. In, it's interesting how the interaction with the political context is so distinct. So we now face issues that are so uh, similar in many ways like the backlash against gender rights, against um, uh, se uh, sexual and reproductive rights, for example, is so similar. But at the same time, it's interesting how we are discussing very different trajectories, especially in what has to do with the interplay with the political context and political forces. So one of the things that I, I thought is how as you, you mentioned, communism and anti-communism meant very different things for uh, these activists, this LGBTQ uh, movement and feminist movements. And one thing that I, I thought, and I'm just sharing like in reaction to your presentation, is how uh, for Brazilian, 
I'm, I, I'm thinking also of Colombian activists, Mexican activists, a social distributive democratic perspective was important because repression came from elitist autocratic forces, autocratic movements. Um, so the control over the bodies of those who were seen as undesirable, socially undesirable for many reasons, came together with the control over um, social uh, activism related to uh, democratic resistance and uh, resistance that had to do with social justice. So just to, uh, to try to make my point maybe a little more clear, um, I think that in South America, in Brazil particularly, uh, queer activism, feminist activism was never an identity kind of activism uh, solely. It was all, it always had very interesting connections with social justice activism and activism related to democratic resistance. And I think that Lampião da Esquina, the, the, the uh, newspaper, it's so interesting to see that how, as you, you, you showed one of the covers, uh, issue in racism. How do we deal with racism? This is so uh, central to our, uh, our universe. And uh, so this is one thing. Uh, a second thing very uh, quickly also, um, I'll, I'll just tell you very quickly. When I was a kid, I remember watching TV during carnival and cross-genderism, uh, uh, travestite kind of, uh, of, of performances were like, so this was so acceptable. Like uh, as a child, I'm, I'm thinking of myself as a, like a 10 year old ch uh, child watching Carnival with my parents and uh, in Sao Paulo. And it was like, it was no, it was not an issue. So I think this is interesting to think of this idea of paradise uh, by João Trevisan, his criticism of the paradise, because there was at the same time, this violence, which was pervasive uh, and some level of acceptance that made some things not, uh, they would not be uh, things that would be said. Like you wouldn't say, intolerance was part of the environment, but of course it was. And, uh, but it was completely different from the reaction, the backlash we have today. This thing that we do not accept it. It's not part of our traditions, of our values. It's not acceptable that we discuss sexuality with children. This was not part of our, of our history, but other things were, of course, it was violent anyway. So. I think this is this ambiguity what is interesting to think of Brazil and maybe Latin America in a way. And just to finish, this global north, south, uh, global south, I really enjoyed uh, hearing you talking about how it came to you and it's so interesting. So just one thing, maybe in a country uh, with the, the size of Brazil and the internal differences we have, it's also interesting to think that there we have our own North and global South three things somehow. Like Sao Paulo is one thing, but the, like the, the hinterlands of Northeast of Brazil for queer activism, for example, the kind of violence, the kind of uh, macho culture, like it's very uh, irregular across the country. So maybe this is something to consider as well. Just to, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed uh, listening to you and seeing uh, what you showed us, thanks. Thank you very much, Flavia. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, and I think I, 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 and I totally agree that you know this is so fascinating to think about those uh, geotemporal uh, organization, you know, between Eastern Europe and Latin America, within Latin America, within Brazil, within Eastern Europe, within Poland, and then East West. You know what you said about how how you thought about you know being in the global East, where suddenly 
uh, Holland was moved to maybe global north, but maybe global south. <laughs> but that's maybe what. So, so I think that this is this is some kind of peripheral uh, position of all of both our regions that make this comparison, which might seem a little crazy from the ver from you know when you look at this. Well, it's crazy to compare the two contexts, but maybe not. Maybe this, I mean, this is what we are doing here, so it's not that crazy. Uh, Hadley, you put your, uh, you, you got unmuted, so I'm assuming you want to say something. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, I wanted to, I, something you said made, made me remember uh, something, if I can, if I can just jump in, and I'm sorry, I apologize to everyone for all of the, like, picture, turning my camera on and off, I have two cats who are going in and out, and <laughs> no, I figure you don't want to watch the ceiling revolve around me. Um, as I go get them, but I, I agree. I think that 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 Carol, your story of of the the complexities of these relationships between North and South and East and West and East and South and East and North, and I, I just wanted to add a little uh, 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 another nuance to that because a couple of years ago, so I teach at Central European University, right, which used to be in Budapest in the East, and now we've moved to the West, uh, Austria, but of course it's really still Central European University, but we get students from all over the world. It used, we used to have an Eastern European focus, but now it's everywhere. And a few years ago in one of my classes, we were talking about these sort of geotemporal relationships the, the, and their dynamics. And I, I think it was a woman from Turkey. I think I, I was saying something about, you know, sexual politics in Hungary as part of this Eastern world, which is in some ways like a global south in relation to Western Europe. And a student from Turkey said, yeah, but, but you know, for, for people like us, um, Hungary is the West. And their understanding of, of what happens and has happened in the past there is totally shaped by thinking of, oh, well, that's actually the West compared to us. So it all depends also on, you know, who you're, who you're talking to um, and where they're standing. Um, so I, I, and I, I think also just in terms of, of how, yeah, there are, I mean, this whole group, you know, this whole project is premised on trying to think about the similarities and differences between South and East or between, you know, Latin America and Eastern Europe. Um, because they, these places are colonial, both colonial places and so both post-colonial places. But of course, this works really different ways, right? Flavia, what you're saying about the different political calculus of, of left and right um, and, and what that can mean. But also just, you know, these are, they're different, they were different colonialisms and they're different, very different post-colonialisms um, with different ways of sort of making things like race, and gender and so sexuality, um, visible and invisible. Anyway, I just wanted to, to throw that out there. Oh, and sorry, last thing, uh, it, on the visible invisible issue, Carol, this thing about this this zine with the invisible ink. Wow, that's so brilliant. <laughs> that's so fascinating. Anyway, I'll stop. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Carol, do you want to respond in some way to Flavia Hadley or? No, I think it, there were very interesting thoughts. I don't have anything to add. I think it was nice to hear that in the context of what I was saying. Yeah, so anyone has some more comments or questions maybe on East and South or, you know, Carol's interpretation of East and South or some possibilities of working between, you know, the the, the idea is also how we can collaborate between the academia and the and the art world because this this are some different methodologies but um, in some way I, I can see we can find the common ground anyone you... go ahead Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Agne. I'm studying at Oxford University, but I'm from Lithuania, so this hits close to home. Um, 
I was just coming first with a comment. This was a brilliant presentation and I enjoyed it very much. And in response to what Flavia said um, about kind of there being a time where some of the less gender conformist expressions were more acceptable and it wasn't even a question. Um, as I'm looking into gender history in the Soviet Union, it seems to me that like once in a while these less gender conforming moments are coming up in Soviet history as well, which I find very, very interesting, like rock bands, even like state-sponsored culture rock bands were forming cross-dressed, or there's this uh, quite famous movie with Ala Pugacheva where she was dressed up as a man. It's called The Woman Who Sings, and she kind of plays herself, but then also plays a male version of herself, and it seems like no one really asks any questions about it, so it just kind of, it related in my mind. But, uh, Carol, to your presentation, I was meaning to ask, you mentioned once that, you know, there's a certain fragmentation between queer archives, and, and it's sometimes difficult to find a point of unity, and you uh, you were at this point of unity in, in one of the exhibitions, but I was meaning to ask about the scenery in Eastern and Central Europe. Um, just if you could elaborate a bit more on that. Um, yeah, what's, it, what's your outlook? Is there much collaboration? Is it fragmented? Is it, how do you see the scene of queer archives in Central and Eastern Europe? Yeah, thank you very much for, for, for the comment and for the, for the question. The question is interesting because uh, in one hand, it's uh, we are living in the times that this official homophobia and uh, transphobia from the government like Poland, Hungary, uh, Belarus, it's super strong. But in the same time, the community is growing in a very diverse way. So the new identities, new voices are much more heard than before, non-binary people, transgender people. And uh, in all of that, there is much more activism presence like a rainbow presence and so on but it's i don't see that it's so much influencing the work with the archives there is an interest there are new books um biographies about the people from the past from the queer feminist perspective but with the archives it's a bit different and um, it's rather going from my experience and i have a lot of friends in all these countries that the activists are trying to narrate the history of their own movements and uh, even in Poland, there is a plan, maybe even this year, to open the LGBTQ museum, but it will be like one flat. But from what I heard, almost nothing will be the same as from my archive, because they are showing rainbow, the first meetings, the lamp, the, how they organize themselves and so on. So it's very interesting for me that we reached the moment that um, actually there are really different histories to be told and they are just constructed now a bit like in the United States through the 80s 90s who is excluded how is described who have the money for that and so on I'm rather on the side of the artists and uh, people who experiment so academics who are not strict and more like uh, writing articles than books and how the stories that are not certainly clear are more interesting than just uh, typical history of the movement. So this is one thing. The other thing is that people are really awake in this feeling of searching some kind of locality, but then it's so focused on the language that rarely I see the people who want to collaborate between the countries of Central Eastern Europe, for example. I was in the one panel with people from Romania, from Budapest and from me and from uh, Amsterdam and uh, activists from Budapest, they literally said, like, why Carl would be interested in reading our books? They all in Hungarian. So there is no point to build a network with our archives because it's not productive anyhow. And then everybody switched to talk with the guy from Amsterdam because the huge institution that's giving him money for archiving, working on the institution. So, and this is a very pattern that I see a lot that uh, of course when we talk about the language it's very important when you talk about the zines and books like if you don't understand you can't work with it but it was the same with me in brazil but then at the end it's about the approach if you want to have somebody who will guide you through that and then you have your second thought how to combine it 
And then you can have like an amazing um, combination. Like for example, I work with Ruszal Kisio, but also with Libusha Yarcoviakova from Prague. And then suddenly the story of the club that they were both going to, plus Douglas Krim visiting Prague in 1984, suddenly you have the picture that none of them have. And so I'm putting all this combination and see. And it's very rare. And I'm not saying like I'm so special, but it's just uh, my kind of approach uh, that it's, not sometimes not going that deep but it's connecting the the contexts that are much different and many activists don't understand and don't want to follow uh that yeah <laughs> this is what i wanted to just stress thank you and i think nicolette had the question yes i i had a question and it's sort of related to to what uh, agnia just asked um, and I was thinking back to the first group uh, with uh, Richard Kishel that you, you started with, who were doing the photography and the sort of events for themselves and who started the, the zine. Um, and, and I was sort of thinking about how do we think about this group? Because they didn't seem to think of themselves as activists at the time. I mean, perhaps they wanted to inform the community. They were thinking about HIV, you know. But but they don't, you know, they don't, you know, come across as sort of activists. And I guess the question is, how do we understand their practice? And did are they becoming activists retrospectively? So as we create these new histories, um, you know, and different histories, you know, what kind of place are they getting in those histories? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. It's also interesting, but very um... Hmm. Yeah, it's like a few things that I want to address. The one thing that Richard Kishos from the very beginning until the, now, he's always considered himself as an activist. And for him, it was rather, he was never an artist. He was never, he could never be in that time. So it's rather opposite. Like I'm trying to get him to the art world and kind of present his work as a serious uh, culture production, while he's constantly referring referring to himself as an activist, uh, because even in seventies they had to, literally he was recalling the moment when he was talking with one medicine student at the beach, like what we should fight for. We heard about the Stonewall riots and like really we don't have uh, anything to fight for. So the magazine and the HIV and AIDS how they were spreading the information he was considering activism. So with this, it's quite clear for me that there is not much problem. Evolution of his magazine, even how it was evolved in the beginning of the 90s, it was just showing that path. Also, he was one of the early founders of Lambda movement. So it's also very big. He is part of this big narration of the what I was just mentioning about this LGBT activists and the history of the movement, which is even more interesting when we talk about his archive, which is amazing, rich, and so on that he decided quite easily to spread out the whole visuals, as he called, is going to me, which is like photographs, negatives, drawings, pictures, all the treasures. And the real museum and LGBT activists, they get press clips, Xerox, informations, magazines, uh, notes, <laughs> which is much less interesting for me. So um, this is also an interesting aspect. And he trusts me because he, is much more presented in museums than anywhere else. Uh, also, I didn't mention that, but after Hayasin action, this violent action, there was a few reactions because not only Richard Kishil actually, but in Warsaw, there was something that was called Warszawski Ruch Homosexualny. It's like Warsaw gay movement. And there were three people who were establishing that organization like really like an activist and uh, all the biographies it's so amazing to see how they uh, land up later one of them become a porn producer really running the gay club sex club the major gay producer uh, porn producer and now he ref refused to any interviews anything just going through some countries just to have holidays and not want to be deal with activism and but he was very radical activist at the beginning. The other one was hardcore radical activist, then emigrate to uh, UK, fighting still with the as a gay activist, and now become suddenly uh, one of the leading 
gay supporting our government, our party is like this uh, right wing gay, uh, which is as crazy as it sounds. So um, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of issues again to make it the picture more complicated. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. And there's also a question in the chat. Sorry, Hadley. <laughs> Let me just, uh, I don't know if everybody can see the question uh, in the chat. That, uh, the question is about uh, historical acceptance of cross-gender performance and to what extent humor or lightness uh, plays the role in the you know, possible acceptance of um, cross-gender performance. Um, I don't know, Carol, if you can... Uh, I, I can briefly reply to that because I, I, I kind of wanted to mention that, that it's uh, previously the people who were researching Polish gay or queer history were like Tom, Krzysztof Tomasik, he wrote a book about the communist times and gays, mostly gays, but also trying to touch upon a bit wider queerness he, he it's it's exactly this that he was based on what it was written in the books and newspapers or other articles so everything was about criminal cases or how ridiculous were gays or trans people in the films actually he's not mentioning the trans people but rather gays who are kind of a drag queens kind of the playing with the lightness and cross-dressing for the obvious we know through the whole history of cinema this kind of type so that was very accepted and the actors were playing this and nobody had a problem with that to be very honest not have any problem with that even now if it's just the performance and the play because it's just something it's completely different when we touch upon the real life that's why Eva Hauschka is such a hardcore example for them because she's a tough fighter opposition member, uh, religious person, deeply religious person, and at the same time saying, I'm a transgender woman, shut up, don't mention my dad name, I just, and that's it, and it's completely not acceptable for them, they have struggle with that, so it's a very good point with this question, that it's completely different, two different things. Yeah, and I think it also, and it also, I think, shows uh, that how much these things go so outside of any box so you cannot say left right religious non-religious uh you know so <laughs> so north east west this this is like really this is really heterogeneous space so we have hadley and then sergio yeah uh, you are unmuted sorry I, yeah sorry i keep having trouble unmuting myself sergio do you want to go first because i already said some things so uh, I can wait. Okay, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I guess. Um, well, yeah, it's a very, very interesting uh, presentation, Carol. I really love it. The, all the, the archival work that you've been doing, documenting, really just rescuing all this uh, kind of um, less known history about the 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 the, 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 the queer the, and, and the and the transgender movement in in, in Poland, right? The, in 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 the eighties, at least. And then try to compare or to bring it to to Brazil to the, the reason of the of the this uh, group meeting that you, that you had. No, I'm not part of the meeting, but I was invited by Agnieszka, and I find it fascinating that it, I, I find a lot of parallelism between what was you were, what you were documenting in Poland, what's going on in Brazil, and um, but I just wanted to to mention that uh, how uh, how do you relate this to contemporary issues related to gender discrimination, uh, to uh, attacks against uh, transgender people above, above all, and the, the community, well, I'm from Mexico, but uh, I, I heard that it's a lot of, uh, a lot of problems going on with, uh, with violence and intolerance against uh, uh, tra tra transgender and transsexual people and cross-dressing people, even in, in Brazil and, and other countries. And this one question, like how, how do you associate all this, this work that, that is going on compared also to what you know and you do in, in Poland, right? This kind of, how this part of so a, 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 an, act, an actual now activism that, or that brings more people into this. And the second question is that when you're talking about Brazil and all the documented history that you present, it's curious that one of the most popular uh, characters of, or at least from Afro-Brazilian culture in Brazil uh, is it's a little bit it's not shown in, in what you mentioned is this uh, 
Paul Flavius is, is gone, no? but she must know the, the, the figure of this uh, person, Madame Sata, no? Madame Sata, this uh, 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 black, uh, black, black man who later from Pernambuco, who travels to Rio de Janeiro, and then Rio de Janeiro, he becomes a very uh, important kind of uh, character, I would call it, in, in, in the lower and popular classes in Brazil. And I know him, I know his history because he, he was a capoeira uh, practitioner, right, from in Rio de Janeiro. And there is a film about Madame Sata and how was, he was using this, this, his position as a travesti, we call it like this, it was a travesti, as a way of uh, becoming a political activist in Brazil. And it was in the 19, it was in, in the 1950s, 1960s, if I'm not mistaken, when he was doing all this, all this work in, in Brazil. And it's interesting how, how, how to frame it, these kind of historical figures that don't, are not part of this mold of the traditional hero or of the traditional uh, representative, because this relates to what you were saying about the interviews you were showing, right? Mm -hmm. You're showing stories by not the traditional representative of certain political or social movement, right? They've been yeah. silenced, they've been in jail, or they've been ignored from, from history, right? Neglected. So that's interesting because you are bringing back all this uh, discussion back to, to the front, right? Also in Poland, in Brazil, I have similar trajectories also in other parts of the world, right? The idea of, of, of this kind of marginality position they have, they, they don't fit the mold, right? And yeah. they face all these kind of things. So I, I find it fascinating what, what you were doing. That That's all, yeah, just got some ideas about it, yeah. Thank you very much, Sergio. Yeah, of course, I'm familiar with Madame Sata and I saw the film and it was constantly coming when I was in Brazil somehow. But first thing, I couldn't make the interview, obviously, because passed away but also it was already introduced as a quite known figure because of the film so in my vitrines maybe you haven't seen it but there was a book uh, related to him her and uh, but uh, what you mentioned about uh, Madame Sata it's connected with this first question how this his this is kind of the question of my life how this history relate to the contemporary and how the history could be productive as a tool on many different levels and i see it very clearly that actually the literally the just the present and the ways you could expose those stories is making the change because many of the homophobic speech is based on this this was not uh, here before like when i was growing up in communist poland in Białystok, northeast part of poland they were saying like this is coming from the West. It was never in Poland. When it was in Warsaw, and I was already living in Warsaw, and I get back to first pride in my hometown that was brutally attacked by the police, I heard this was maybe rich Warsaw and big cities, but it was never here, not in this city. Then I was in Kyiv, and I heard the same, not in Ukraine. It's something from the West. The, the rap group with Nikita Kadan, where straight guys presenting the happening with Warhol and Joseph Boyce slogans, and they were attacked by the nationalists as a pederast, as a faggot. This huge opposition of the uh, West connected with Eurosodom, with the general idea of homophobia. So all you can do by just exposing the stories, these figures from the local context is go going against this kind of narration. And it's a only level how you can reach the bigger audience. With Ma Madame Sate, it's perfect because you have a film, almost like a Hollywood film. Many stories that if they reach Netflix, for example, in pop culture, they already do the job, they reverse the narration. I'm trying to do my best by introducing things through the film festivals, magazine and exhibitions, and also by creating very visual, uh, through the portraits, very visual uh, uh, presentation of those people, so people immediately could recognize them. Also, in Central Eastern Europe, there's not that many uh, older queer artists like I am. <laughs> <laughs> like being this veteran and not being just 20 something it's I know it sounds funny but it makes the difference because uh, people know that if I'm doing a major museum show and I'm just uh, 
uh, presenting something. Uh, they knew that this was painted by Carl, so it means that person was queer, even if it's like a nationalist poet. Oh, she was lesbian. He, he painted her. So it's also the way of appropriating the visual sphere and making very contemporary use of that. And I think it works. And also, I'm, I started to say, like, I, I still go into the prides, I'm signing the petitions, but my goal is to influence what will be in the books. It's better if it will be even to kids and teenagers than any other books. And I'm just doing this agenda, and it's uh, exactly what the government is afraid, afraid the most. And I feel um, sometimes the younger activists, they don't feel that they could use that tool. But it's really useful. It's literally when you're saying, if you started to tell more and at the end you will present like a half of the Polish culture is made by the non-heteronormative people, how this speech could still work against the something that came from the West, it's just introduced. And maybe on the political level, they don't want to hear that. They just get mad, but then they impose even harder and more strict uh, school programs because they feel they are losing already and th that's uh, how i feel that it's working but from the regular people in poland i feel works perfectly because the society become more and more tolerant be beyond the political system and i think only because not only simple coming out of the movie stars but rather also to learning that the half of the history should be presented in a different way uh, and just just to, to to conclude here, sorry, sorry. Uh, this remind me also the these forms of expression, right? You say, well, a book, and it remind me the work of this uh, Mexican, who's called is an indigenous activist who was actually in Poland not so long time ago, Lucas Avendaño, who is also part of the of, of this is having the same goal of trying to bring the 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 visibility to all the tra transgender and the queer community, right? In Mexico, he's a, he's he's an activist. Uh, well, this is this just a note that 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 appeared in, I guess. Um, let me see if if, if, if he, he Lucas Avendaño. Well, I can later send it. The Lucas Avendaño. I put uh, to everybody just the. It's in Polish, right? But it's he's a theater artist, an activist whose uh, brother was uh, disappeared in in Mexico three years ago or something like that. But anyway, he's an indigenous activist who is coming from. Um, from a, from from a group of um, uh, from transgender from the transgender community in in, in Mexico and actually what he's trying to do is to do performances also to bring all these kind of issues related to the the fluid gender and different issues. No, so it's very interesting what what what, what you're saying because it actually relates to what other act activists are doing in Mexico just to bring some visibility, right? More visibility to all 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 these pro problems that people don't want to. They want to hear about it. No? Many people don't want to hear about it, but it's important that we hear about all this. No? Yeah, I totally agree. And there are even more, of, of course, artists and activists. Just to summarize, yeah. I would say yeah. that if you have the queer figures from the past and even if they were prominent and everybody knows them, and even if everybody knows that they probably were non heteronormative, it's not part of the educational process, or they are saying it's nothing to do with their work, but then actually when you start to look at the poems, the paintings, suddenly everything looks different. So this, this is also part of my work and agenda. Like if you impose the interpretation, then it's changing the whole culture. And when the culture is changed, then the education is changed. And then when the education is changed, the future is changed. That's so quite simple, I would say. Well, you are really optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, I have to be, because otherwise there is no point to do that work. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So I think that we are running out of time, but I think sadly, you know, this is the last, uh, uh, the last question, comment. No, go ahead. It, uh, are you sure? I don't know how much yeah, yeah, time we've I got, think... because it's sort of a big question. Um, I know, I think we'll, we love your questions, so. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, so, so I, this actually ties to what, what Carl, you you were just saying. Um, one of the things I was wondering about is what, what you know about some of the other aspects of the his, different histories, right? Of places like Brazil and, and, and Poland or Latin America and, and Eastern Europe um, with respect to things like traditions of representation. So, you know, thinking about all these visual representations and the way they might have 
educational effects or the ways in which people understand you know the uses of photography or the 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 ways in which um you know certain kinds of images of certain kinds of bodies become politically meaningful or as or seen as not even politically but you know personally exciting that I, I expect not being a, a an artist or an art historian myself but i expect there must be quite different traditions in in a representation in, in in these places do you have you looked into that i mean what do, what do you what do you know about sort of how that's shaped these different scenes what you put in a zine how you structure the imagery of a zine say mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I will try to explain briefly. The idea is that I call my project Queer Archives Institute in plural because I do the research, I travel, I do the connections, and in my shows I'm introducing part of that. But then the whole idea is to work with other artists that are more locally engaged with the exactly this, the way of the representation and so on. So even the show that I'm having now in Berlin that is going for two weeks until the middle of April. It's like I invited people from seven countries and they are just bringing their own research in with the specific local context. So that's rather the idea. I, I don't struggle with representing and going through some context rather, uh, but uh, I, choose to invite people like I do the Ukrainian issue so I have the guest editor from Ukraine who is uh, deeply in the language and the context and I'm just giving a space or saying what I feel and how I experience that so this is quite clear for me right I guess what I'm wondering though is is I mean have you have you noticed things do you have you have in in looking at the other people's work from different places that you know that you've you've included and you know the people you brought along is there anything that you've noticed about boy that you know people from this sort of place seem to to focus on on different aspects of you know queerness or gayness or whatever body bodiliness than than sort of people in poland do say i mean just on a on a more casual basis I, th I think there's not that much difference in Europe. It's rather like when you think about other continents, like I recently spoke with Matthew, he's from Nigeria and talk was talking to me how they are trying to build a kind of history and archive. And obviously this is kind of different reference and different roots. I think in Brazil, it was also interesting for me that many artists deal with the very minimalist abstract works. And mm -hmm. even if they have a queer identity, they would express themselves through very abstract works. And then you need mm -hmm. the code to record it. Mm -hmm. less difference between east and west europe because it's very about the body and body presence and also through the avant-garde movements and so on it's easier through the performances introduced yeah yeah that's fascinating thank also you also the many painters especially 19th century when they were building national identities through the images of this all of them were studied in munich so if you go budapest poland st petersburg or uh, cologne there will be kind of references from the 9th century munich school or vienna and then uh, repeating these patterns uh -huh. yeah okay great thank you well, thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. And thanks everybody for, you know, I think this is real, that was really amazing discussion and amazing presentation. Uh, thanks so much, Carol, for your work and for being part of our network. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. I also happy that we have the discussion, not just the presentation. And I'm